The strength, I don't know where it came from. You know, you, you, somehow, when you have to do something, you do it. And that was the actual thing on April 23rd in the morning. They said that there'll be no more shooting of the people that were left behind. And, you know, we didn't believe them, neither did... There were some Germans in our group, by the way, as well. Uh, it was a camp of... a mixed camp. Jews, Germans... And did they shoot anyone after that? They didn't. They didn't. And uh, at about a quarter to ten on the April 23rd, 1945, we were passed by by the first American tank. It was this 7th Army, 3rd Battalion Cavalry that was liberating us. Okay. How did you feel when you were liberated? Well, it's quite hard to describe when you liberated after f over five years of uh, worse than slavery. Uh, th believe it or not, my first thought when I was, when I knew, when I was told I'm a free man, uh, was kind of fright. Like, who's going to take care of me now? that I'm, I can do whatever I want. I can go wherever I want. Uh, in an odd sort of way, you feel that you're on your own, which you haven't been for five years. And uh, the feeling is very odd. Of course, this disappears very quickly when you get the first uh, carton of K-rations throw, thrown at you by the... By the uh, American truck, and you sit down and fill your tummy with your first food, decent food. And uh, this day of liberation was very, was, uh, it will never be erased from my memory because we were together, five of us, and we made it. We lived through it. In other words, we considered ourselves victors at that point. Uh, we had some baked potatoes at night with champagne with a Jewish officer from the American army. Very odd combination, baked potatoes and champagne. And uh, we were, and then we all went sick. In other words, we were quite ill for about a month. A Dr. Agen, a captain of, uh, an American captain, uh, discovered us and gave us a place to stay. And he furnished, uh, found out that we were musicians. So he furnished us with instruments and music. We couldn't even blow into those instruments. We couldn't do a thing about it for about two months. But then he said, just keep on trying and practicing. He says that one hour of music in any DP camp would be better than all the medicines they can get in a month. And after about two months or so, we started playing for, for the DP camps all around Germany. And we played for the U.S. Army, for the French Army, for the British, for the Soviets. We played for everyone that we could play for. And we traveled around. We had our own truck. And uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, it was a German uh, ambulance that we traveled in and entertained mostly in DP camps like Feldafing, Landsberg, uh, Regensburg, uh, 
throughout Germany, uh, all over Germany and Austria. What did you play. call yourselves? We called ourselves the Happy Boys, just to think about it, how happy we were. And uh, we had a group of pretty good musicians, and we made a we made a pretty good uh, name for ourselves with the people. Of course, we we didn't play for money. We played f so that the UNRWA at that time was able to give throw in our way some support, and we had support from the U.S. Army. And uh, they gave us uniform, officers' uniforms to wear without insignia. All kinds of things were happening to us, which were kind of pleasant to remember. These were good times for you? These were pretty good times, <clears throat> except when we encountered some Germans who still believed that the Jews should be eliminated. And we could sense that many were very, very sympathetic to us, but many, when they, s you could just see the look in their face that, like, we have failed. We didn't eliminate them all. You could just feel, you know, that we have developed the survivors, I think, or I have developed such a sense of sensing in other words that the the, the extra s uh, an extra sense of feeling i would say uh, throughout the years like in, in a selection to be able to jump from one line to another without knowing which one is going to die uh, it's perhaps some kind of an instinct that most people under normal st circumstances lose and under extreme circumstances are able to to use uh, and that's one of the things that i mentioned about the germans i didn't have to speak to a german long uh, in order to see that he felt somehow that he failed because i'm still here uh, it wasn't said so, but it was felt pretty strong sometimes. Did you consider going back to Poland? I never did. As a matter of fact, I, I blame the Pole more than I blame the German. The German was German, and if he didn't collaborate with the authorities, he, he ended up either like me or close to it, like me. And I met those. They were Germans in our camps, in some of our camps. Not extermination camps, but the ones, the work camps, there were Germans in it. But the Pole didn't have to collaborate. I don't say that everyone did. I would never say that because I'm too much of an individualist to blame a nation. There is no such a thing. I can't even blame all the Germans. But the Pol there, is what, there was a vast majority of Poles who were too cooperative with the German authorities. So of course, some of them hid out Jews and rescued them. And we, we know that for a fact. But there were just too many to collaborate. And that's why you didn't go back to Poland? That's when my brother went back to Poland. He went back to Poland just for a day or two. Uh, two reasons. One, to go through the rubble of our apartment and see whether he could find something, which he did. Found some pictures and some stuff. And two, to smuggle out a lady doctor from Poland, which was already not permitting exits for professionals like doctors at that time. And he did bring her to Germany. She ended up in Chicago afterwards.
Of your whole family, how many people survived? Out of my immediate family. And your cousins that, and... Oh. My mother being so close to the family was like the prime minister of the family. That's why everybody was close to us. I would say, roughly, we had about, with relatives, you know, cousins, second cousins, third cousins, we had about 300 in the family. Out of my immediate family, my brother and I are alive out of seven. I count my grandmother. Uh, out of the whole family, out of the 300 people that I could probably name them, I probably, there's probably another seven or eight alive. That's just about the figure. No more than eight. Do you think about why you survived? Sometimes I think about it. I don't give it too much thought. I think, I, I like, I hate to ascribe it just to luck. Uh, uh, you know, how lucky is a survivor, really? You know, so it's not just a matter of luck. There must have been, there's a, perhaps a purpose in, sur in, in somebody like me surviving. Uh, the purpose could be to let the world know that there was a, such a thing as Auschwitz, or that there was such a thing as World War II. Uh, a tremendous amount of information is omitted from the history books. Uh, perhaps the emphasis should be put on, I try to, you know, I have to give you a quick little outlook. I didn't speak a word of English when I landed in Halifax in 1948. I was 30 years old. It is pretty hard for a 30-year-old to adapt himself to a new land, new kind of life, and learn the language to the point where I can teach. So I think that I, perhaps the mission was to learn the language and leave the message. And, uh, otherwise, maybe I wouldn't have survived. But I feel that, uh, maybe I felt that I have that purpose during the whole thing, you know, to quote Frankl. Uh, the reason for survival uh, makes, makes the survival possible. That's all I can think of, really. Were you able to talk about your Holocaust experiences? Oh, yes. I have spoken to schools. Uh, I was invited to some schools to talk about it. I usually talk about it for about 20 minutes, just give them a quick outlook on happenings. What kind of questions do they and, ask? Uh, I get some very strong questions right at me. Uh, do you think a thing like this could happen again, or could it happen here? Or, and uh, of course my answer is, is yes, it could happen anywhere, it could happen anytime. <clears throat> Depends on how the youth looks at it. And I recently answered that question by saying that perhaps one of you out of a hundred students will sometimes be a lead a leader of a nation or a leader of a group or a leader. and it's up to you to see to it that does not happen again you know in other words the organ the people must see to it that this thing cannot happen again because uh, the technology the way it is now 
there would be no problem, like I mentioned before, that uh, uh, they had problems with eliminating that many people in one, at one time. So this would present, represent no problem at all nowadays. Is that why you come forward to talk about it? I had to come forward to talk about it. After years of silence, I must relay, I, I must tell the world what can be prevented. And that's just about my message. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Eisenman, for told us. You're quite welcome. Can I have to? Sure. 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 S